it is a blessing for us to have a Lord the one that we can say this that we will call for him and we can be sure that he will answer our call during the night during the moments that we need when we seek him we can always find him and I above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine let's sing that one more time together and I will call upon your name I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes. And keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans arise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours. And you are. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to know you personally. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for this morning for worship. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. And uh, just a word of pastoral encouragement for you this morning. Don't take this the wrong way. But our service starts at 10 o'clock, okay? <laughs> I don't know who was here at 10 o'clock. We had about five people here. And look at now, it's almost getting full. I just want to encourage you to do your best to arrive here on time so that we can start the service uh, on time. This is not anyone in particular, okay? Please, not de designed for anyone in particular. But it just helps us uh, uh, have a better environment to start our service, okay? Just a little bit of pastoral encouragement for all of us this morning. And trust me, I understand it's hard to get out of the house. I have two little ones. We know what it's like. So that's not a, uh, uh, it's just an encouragement this morning. This morning, I also want to introduce to you um, a couple. Paula, if you could stay here for just a minute, Paulina uh, and Hinatu. I want to introduce a couple that is going to be helping us with our connections ministry here at Union Church. Uh, we have decided the second semester that we really want to emphasize connections, uh, which means bringing new people into the church, engaging people in the context of church community, uh, doing events, and um, Hinatu is, is going to be kind of helping us with that effort. And so uh, let's welcome him this morning, him and Paula. And so uh, these guys are a fantastic couple that have moved here from Paraíba, from João Pessoa. And, and they uh, are primarily going to be working with Acts 29 Historic Brazil, uh, the ministries that I'm leading. But we are going to give them uh, uh, some time to focus on Connections Ministry here at Union Church as we do a little bit of a process of revitalization, uh, revitalizing the church a little bit, uh, the second semester in particular. And so I want to just encourage you to get to know them and to know that we have many uh, things coming up. You already saw we're going to have, um, at the end of this month, an event at the uh, Bosque de Baja. Next month, we're going to have our international dinner. In, uh, in November, we're going to have our Thanksgiving time. So we have several things planned for the second semester. And Hinatos and, and, and Paula, particularly Hinato, are going to be uh, uh, helping us with that. And I don't know, if Hinato, if you have something that you'd like to share. Now, Hinato likes to talk. So it could be a little bit, okay, she's, she's right, Jayetta, right? Uh, Hinatu likes to talk, so if you want to talk, it's good to talk with Hinatu. But um, I am going to give him an opportunity just to um, maybe share for a minute here. Go ahead. Hey, yeah? Good. So it's really good. Uh, can I punch him out now? No, no. Jaka, Jaka, can I try to pull to a keynote? So it's uh, a big pleasure to be here, and, uh, you know, God's called me to... To come to Rio, Jay spoke to me a few years ago, right? When we met each other, I think three years ago, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, he said, hey, it would be nice if you could join us. I said, well, I'm praying for that. I will start to pray for that because my heart is in at, at the first time say, not yet, right? And I told you this and said, okay, so keep praying because God already told me. So, <laughs> yeah, here I am. <laughs> so God is awesome. So we move it here. And the same time that God uh, spoke to me, God spoke to my family. And everybody, so we already feel at home. Uh, actually, it's my second week here, and it's like we're living here forever, you know, and God is awesome. God is good, and I, I, pray, I pray to God that I, we, God can use us uh, for His glory and to bless your lives, and we are here to serve you guys, you know, at any time. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you. Well, Hinato, it's just a blessing to have you here, and we're definitely praying that the Lord uses you in a mighty way, so thank you, brother. Also, yeah, let's just see him. Thank you so much. Also, just want you guys to know that um, Hinatsu actually moved here. He was working for Compassion International. And those of you who may be familiar with Compassion, it's a fantastic organization that's focused on discipling kids uh, who are in underprivileged uh, backgrounds, particularly in very poor areas. And so he was working with those projects in the northeast of Brazil. That was his job, to, to bring in teams and to kind of basically promote Compassion. And so as part of his work here with Acts 29, he's actually helping us forge a, a, a relationship with, with Compassion International in Acts 29, where we're planting churches in primarily poor areas that are going to start with 150 or 200 kids sponsored through Compassion International. So it's a fantastic project where we're seeing a church planted and a project established at the same time. And so uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to talk with Hinato, Paulo, or myself. But um, once again, it's really fantastic to have. And also, Paul, she's a great blessing as well. Um, fluent in English, um, taught at English school, one of the best English schools, uh, La Juan Pessoa. And so she's going to be a great asset to the Union Church family as well. So welcome once again, guys, this morning. Well, um, and incidentally, they're living in the same building as our Pakistani friends. And so it's going to be fun because they'll get to know uh, uh, that family is a fantastic family to have in our church as well. This morning we're continuing our series in the book of Philippians, To Live is Christ, To Die is Gain. So if you wouldn't mind opening your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 this morning, the Apostle Paul wrote this book to the church he founded in Philippi. And remember, the Apostle Paul's core group was basically... Uh, a woman who was prior, pr previously possessed by a demon, a jailer, and also another woman named Lydia who was leading a small prayer group meeting. And this is kind of his core group of his church plan. And so he, he was writing this book from a prison cell to the church. And despite the circumstances, Paul wrote with a sense of great joy for everything that, the, that, that had happened up to that point. Everything that God was doing in the church in Philippi that he founded, that he planted. And so over the course of the past three weeks, we've studied the life of the Apostle Paul in this particular moment. And we learned first that the Apostle Paul had a great affection for the church. And so he knew all of his church by name. He cared for them. He was noting their whereabouts. He was really concerned about his church. He prayed for them. Secondly, we learned that Paul suffered greatly. We talked about that two weeks ago, about the suffering that he experienced. There were men who pledged to not eat or drink until what? Until Paul was killed. So, I mean, I don't know if you want that. I don't want that. But yet he had joy in the midst of it. And then last week, we learned that Paul had a great desire for eternity. And so much so that he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so this man who loved the church greatly, who suffered greatly, and who had a great desire for eternity, gives us some important instruction in chapter 2. So we're moving on from that to now some instruction that he's given us. And instruction is not complicated, to be honest with you, but it's hard for us to put into practice. And the instruction is basically this, be like Jesus, kill your pride, and pursue humility. So let's say that together. Be like Jesus, kill your pride, and pursue humility. Now, the operative word here is Jesus, because you're not going to be able to kill your pride without Jesus, and you're not going to be able to have humility without Jesus. 
So, let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 and stand as we read the word of the Lord together. Amen. I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to church, okay, since I'm in the exhorting mood this morning. I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to church if you, if you don't mind. I know we put them up here in the screens. We do that to facilitate. Um, I've often thought about not even putting them up on the screen just because I like the idea of you bringing your Bibles to church. And so if you wouldn't mind helping me uh, or doing that, I think it's good for us as a church. Philippians 2.1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one of spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Verse 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? You may be seated. There are very few texts in Scripture that, I mean, Scripture is amazing, but this text is an amazing text. I mean, this text just kind of preaches itself. It's like I could just leave this text here and sit down and you guys could read this text 10 times and you're going to find 10 different sort of amazing things in this text because there's so much to be found. But let me say this. We have to recognize that we don't live the way that we should, that we don't live lives that are full of humility, but oftentimes we live lives that are full of pride. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, overcoming pride or pursuing humility. Superando o orgulho, or perseguindo a humildade. That is our focus this morning. You see, being inconsistent with who we are in Christ is one of the greatest challenges that we as Christians face. Living in a way that is not consistent with the gospel is not only foolish, it's actually ridiculous. Now think about that word for a minute, ridiculous. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that, let's say that, that let, me, let me say it this way. Many of you think, many of us think that other people live in a ridiculous manner, right? Many, I don't know if you've ever gone over to someone's house, right? You've gone over to someone's house, whether they're a friend of yours or not, and you look at their house, and you think to yourself, I can't believe that they live in this manner. Now, Perhaps your house is a mess, they don't keep it up, they don't care about keeping it up, perhaps their house should appear on that, store, or that show that's called Accumuladores here in Brazil, I forget the name in English because I've been in Brazil too long, what's it called in English? Hoarders, right? Perhaps that's not the problem, perhaps they have dogs and cats and a lot of them, it's okay a dog here, a cat here, but they have a lot of animals, and let's be honest, you enter the house and it's like, oh my Smells like urine everywhere. They haven't trained the animals properly. There's animal hair all over the house. So you sit on a sofa and you wake up, or you're not wake up. <laughs> you, you get up and then your shirt's a completely different color because of all the hair. Perhaps you realize that their house they, 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 is clean, but it's full of tension. And so there's lots of arguments. And so, but the very moment that you're in the house, you realize that you know, there's a lot of tension there. And so this person that was so peaceful and was so cool outside the house, you enter the house and it's like, my gosh, briga, you know, arguments. And you're like, how is this person that could be so nice at church be this way at home? And because there's, they're so often that way with their spouse or with their, their husband or whatever, when you enter the house, it's hard for them to change, right? And so you leave these kind of situations a little flabbergasted. 
You think, how can someone live this way? How could a reasonable person choose to live this way? It seems so ridiculous. It seems so inconsistent. Now, honestly, and I'm being completely honest here, I wasn't thinking about anyone in particular when I gave these examples, okay, just so you know. I believe we've all experienced some of this. I know we've all been in situations where we wondered how people could live the way that they live and the manner that they live, that they would behave the way that they do. And in chapter 2 of the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is giving his church counsel. And what he's saying is, in verses 1 through 4, he's showing them the absolute incompatibility of a self-centered, egocentric, pride-filled life for someone who calls himself a Christ follower. He's showing them this is ridiculous. This is inconsistent. This is not gospel-centered. And so he's showing them what's truly ridiculous. He's saying it's ridiculous to live selfishly in light of the cross. It's ridiculous to live arrogantly in, in the light of the cross. It's ridiculous to live in a manner that's all about you, where you discard and despise others, using them for your own gain in light of the cross. It's ridiculous for you to call yourself a Christian and to not pursue unity in Christ. It's ridiculous, in essence, to live in this way. And so Paul is saying, this pride that you're struggling with, this selfish ambition, this conceit, this arrogance, this is not who Jesus is. And you call yourself a Christ follower. Now, that can be tough instruction for us to handle. Because none of us, or few of us, believe that we live that ridiculously. We, none of us really truly believe that we're that inconsistent. But I want for you to consider for a moment that it's possible that you are living somewhat that way. That it's possible that you're living a life far away from God's best for you. So let's break this down a little bit more in the text this morning. In verse 1, Paul says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then do what? Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in mind. So Paul is actually using positive sort of reinforcement here. He's saying, because you are unified with Christ, because you know Christ, you should be like-minded with Christ. He's saying, with everything that you've seen and heard, with everything that you've experienced in the gospel, it would be ridiculous if you didn't encourage one another. It would be ridiculous if you didn't com comfort one another. It would be ridiculous if you weren't compassionate towards one another. Are you not Christians? And he says this, do this not only for one another, but do it for me. It's going to bring me great joy when you do this. It, it, it brings him great joy when you, when you pursue godliness, when you pursue unity, when you don't air your, your problems in places where they shouldn't be aired, where you pursue unity, when you're one in spirit and in love. And so many Christians are not known by the words that I've shared here. Let's be honest. Many Christians are not known by tenderness, by compassion, by love. Many Christians, unfortunately, are known by different words. Self-centered, self-righteous, brash. And so what I've seen over, over the years of ministry is this. The interesting thing, at least in the States and here in Brazil, it may not be that way over, you know, everywhere, but non-Christians can tolerate a lot of what Christians do. Non-Christians can actually tolerate a lot of what we do. They can tolerate sometimes their immaturity. They can tolerate sometimes our lack of wisdom. They can tolerate sometimes even our beliefs that they disagree with. But what one thing that they have difficulty tolerating is self-righteousness. One thing that they have difficulty tolerating is pride, is arrogance. And the reason why is because self-righteousness and pride are the clearest signs of hypocrisy for the Christian. Because it's the exact opposite of who Jesus is. And so therefore, our testimony is thrown to the wolves when we live lives that are full of pride. Did not Jesus spend most of his earthly ministry 
rebuking the Pharisees? Did he not spend most of his earthly ministry teaching religious people that the letter of the law was not going to save them, but it was rather the Spirit, whom he gives, and as part of his union with the Father and the Spirit, whom he is? And so Jesus was exceedingly preoccupied with the witness of his followers. He did not want his followers to be overly religious, nor did he want them to be worldly. He wanted his father, followers to be full of Christ, to be full of him, to be full of Christ-like humility, Christ-like love. But we know that Christ-like humility is hard to come by because culture teaches us the opposite of what Jesus teaches. Culture teaches us to be self-centered, to be consumers, to think of ourselves more than others, but this is the opposite of humility. Now, I want to stop here for a minute because I want to, I want to explain something that oftentimes happens when we have situations in our lives where we're dealing with difficulties and we decide to go to, for, for example, psychologists or uh, psychiatrics or those kinds of things, right? I don't have a problem with people that are giving counsel because there's a lot of counsel out there that needs to be given. But be careful when you go in these kinds of environments because here's what happens. Oftentimes, I've seen really good Bible-believing Christians, Christians go into a counseling session and they, they come out, even with a Christian counselor, and they say this. You know what? I've discovered that I just haven't had time for me. I, I, I discovered that I haven't, been, I haven't been thinking about me. I haven't put kind of me first. I've been thinking about my kids. I've been thinking about my family. And so, you know, what's been good is that, you know, the Bible says that we need to love ourselves. And so I'm just working on that self-love, and I need to take care of me first, and then things are going to fall into place. What's the problem oftentimes with this counsel? The problem is it actually ends up being about you. Because much of psychology, when it's not properly uh, delineated, is merely substituting one idol for another. So you come into the psychological session thinking that you have one idol, one problem, and then you walk out with another idol, right? And so, so the, the thing is this. Oftentimes the idol that you start with is something like, I have this problem, and, and then basically the psychologist will say, well, then you just need to focus on your family. Or you need to just focus on your kids. Or you need to just focus on yourself. But the problem is, if you're not focused on God, nothing is going to fundamentally change. And so make sure that when you go into sessions of counseling, that you're dealing with someone who knows the word of God. Because if they don't know the word of God, they're not going to teach you the gospel. And if they don't teach you the gospel, what's going to end up happening is you're going to merely substitute one idol for another. You might feel better, but it's temporary. Now, there's some great Christian counselors. There, there's situations that I've... As a pastor, I know I'm not qualified to treat, and so I'll refer them to someone who is a Christian counselor who is godly. So this is not a, this is not a criticism of Christian counseling. But be careful that in the counseling, you don't come out more self-centered than when you went in, because it happens more than you think. I need to take care of me now. It's my time. I spent 15 years taking care of my kids, or 25 years, and now it's time for me. I'm going to take, and whenever you start hearing that word, me, 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 coming out of your mouth, you're doing the very opposite of this text, where it says that we should think of the interest of others above our own, right? And so sometimes that just means suffering for the cause of the gospel. Now, there's certainly a lot of situations where we need to get out. We do need to think about ourselves. Sometimes you're in patterns where you need to get out of that pattern, right? But that doesn't mean that it ends up being all about you. Because at the root, it's never all about us. It's always all about Jesus, and in making everything all about Jesus, what, then, what ends up happening? We actually end up prospering. Because it's in our relationship with Jesus that we prosper. We're always going to prosper more when he's the fount. Right? So, that wasn't in my notes, but, you know. Right? So anyways, Christ's like humility and love are not so easy to come by because culture does teach us to be self-centered. And this is the opposite of humility and so Paul wrote to the church in verse 3 here, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Difficult. Difficult for all of us. Difficult for your pastor, <laughs> me. Difficult for you. Not easy for anybody. But God calls us to it. The theologian John Stott said something brilliant but simple. 
Pride is our greatest enemy. Pride is our greatest enemy. And conversely, humility is our greatest friend. And so what's the origin of of the selfish ambition of this vain conceit? What is the origin of this pride? It's Satan. I mean, if you read Isaiah, Satan was originally an angel created by God. He became very proud. He went on to tempt our original parents, Adam and Eve, and they sinned. And so pride is the original sin. It's demonic. It's satanic. Contrast that with humility. Humility is Christ-like, spirit-enabled. Any human being that has any measure of humility is a miracle. It's something that's a gift from God. Humility is a gift from God. It's a result of the spirit. Our sin nature will always give in to pride. Now, what are some obvious signs of pride? I want to give you just three or four here. Actually, five, I think. Some obvious signs of pride in your life. Because perhaps you're here this morning, you're like, blah, 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 pastor's talking about pride again. You know, I know I'm a little prideful. I'm going to work on it. You know, I need to check out. I'm already ready for lunch. No. Press that to some. Pay attention. Because we all have problems with pride. So I want you to listen to some of these evidences, and hopefully you can say to yourself, yeah, that's me. First, pride always causes us to compare ourselves with others. And so... In English, we use this term, keeping up with the Joneses. It's exhausting. It's an exhausting way to live. They have a nice car, so I need to get a nice car. They have a nice apartment, so I need to get a nice apartment. Their kids are going to this school, so I need to go to that school. uh, They're uh, whatever, whatever it is. They're doing X, I need to do X. They're doing this in the church, well, I need to show that I'm doing something as well. Exhausting. Humility is different. Humility doesn't cause us to compare ourselves to other people. Humility causes us to compare ourselves to who? Jesus. So if you struggle with pride, compare yourself constantly to Jesus. Maybe you think that you're the smartest and most successful person that you know, but compared to Jesus, we know that you're not that smart and you're not that successful, right? Secondly, pride covets the success of other people. And so, therefore, when other people succeed, we become jealous or envious of those people. That's why sometimes we love to see a celebrity kind of like fall, or we love to see, it's perverse, really. Uh, Even pastors fall. I mean, it's perverse because we critique people when they succeed, and we're jealous, and we, but humility allows us to not covet the success of others, but to celebrate it. So as the Bible says, we rejoice with those who rejoice. That's a sign of humility. When you can rejoice when your enemy or someone you don't like has something positive happen, that's a sign that you're walking in humility. Rejoice, the Lord is using them. Be glad for God's grace has been extended to them. Third, pride is inherently selfish. So, It's all about me, it's all about what I want, what I think, what I feel, it's what I declare, in some churches, declaring all the time. It's about what I deserve, that's pride. Humility is the opposite. Humility is about Jesus, humility is about other people. Humility allows someone to be selfless, even if their natural inclination is to be selfish. Fourth, pride is about my glory. And this is, this is a struggle that I face as a pastor sometimes when I feel disrespected or dishonored. And I think you all can identify with that because you all have contexts in your lives where you may feel disrespected or dishonored. But the first thing that you tend to do is say this, do you know who I am? You ask yourself, you're sort of asking yourself this question, does this person know who I am? Do they know what I've done? Do they respect me? Do they honor me? Do they praise me? Do they like me? Do they want to be like me? That's what pride does. Humility is about the glory of Jesus Christ. Humility says, does that person know Jesus? Does that person honor Jesus? Does that person respect Jesus? Do you see the difference? It ends up not being about whether or not they honor, love, and respect you, but whether or not they honor, love, and respect Jesus. And when they do honor, love, and respect Jesus, at least in the context of a church environment, they're going to honor, love, and respect you as their pastor. Because that's what Jesus teaches them to do, right? 
So you begin with Jesus, and it's so much of an easier argument. It doesn't become about those kinds of things. In the same way, in secular environments where the Bible says, listen, respect the authorities. Respect that the Lord has put those the Lord has put over you. So, pride is about my glory. Humility is about the glory of Jesus Christ. And fifth, the point of pride at the end of the day is about in, independence. I mean, Satan was the one that wanted to be separated from God, right? That's what he wanted. We see as sinners, we want to live independently of God, doing what we want. But humility is not about independence. Humility is about dependence at the end of the day. Humility is about dependence. It's about acknowledging God that we're his, we're the created, he's the creator, so we're dependent on him for everything. Dependent on him for everything. I mean, I know I've shared this example before, but someone created everything. Someone created this iPad. Someone created this. For every created thing, there is a creator, which is, at the end of the day, the big problem with people who say that everything came from nothing. Because logically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You kind of have to do some have some intellectual dishonesty to believe that everything came from nothing. One of the great church founders said this, pride is the mother of all sin. It's debatable whether or not it was Augustine or Aquino that said that, but pride is the mother of all sin. It's the mother of all sin. Pride, therefore, is pregnant with all kinds of sin always ready to give birth to all kinds of sin. That's the problem with pride. Pride is the root sin that leads to the fruit of sin, which means conversely that humility is the mother of all joy. So remember what we said at the beginning. Be like Jesus, kill your pride, pursue humility. So I hope that what I've shared helps us to think through a little bit, how living a prideful life is inconsistent, totally inconsistent with being a follower of Christ, and what, how humility through Jesus leads us to something different. So let's read the second part of our text once again this morning. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so, here in verses 5 through 7 at least, Paul is writing to the church and he's saying this. Jesus is the most humble person who ever lived. And so to be humble, we should be followers of Jesus, right? And so the truth is, only Christians at the end of the day have the ability to really understand humility. Now you may say, well, I don't know about that, Jay, because there's a lot of humble people out there. Well, there's some humility that's sort of extended to people as a result of what we call common grace. But at the end of the day, the the, the profound depths of humility are only known by those who are truly Christ's followers, not because we're better than anyone else, but because humility at the root is only found in Jesus first who made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, who was made in human likeness, who humbled himself even to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. One theologian put it this way. He said this, One of the reasons that I know that the Bible is true is that you and I would have never invented a humble God. Our God is the most humble God. Because Jesus is the most humble person, and his death on the cross is the most humble event and act in the history of the universe. And so the truth is, Jesus did not only humble himself by becoming a man, which is already a big big act of humility, but he humbled himself enough to die on a cross. And so we get a great deal with this, guys. I I don't know if you fully understand this. Let me explain to you the deal, the troka that we get with this, the exchange that we get with Jesus. All of my sin goes on Jesus, and all of his perfection is given to me. All of my condemnation goes on Jesus, and all of, all of his salvation comes to me. My separation from God goes to Jesus, 
and his reconciliation with God is given to me. Now, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. You're not going to find a better deal than that. I mean, that's, that's the best deal in the world because God died for us. He forgives us. He gives us a new life, and he forgives us of all of our sins. And that's the good news of the gospel. And that's why we're going to baptize a few people next week. Because they believe that for the first time. They say, you know, I want that deal. I mean, I don't want to reduce this to some kind of deal. I'm not talking about a deal like you see on shopping, uh, on television or something, right? That's not the kind of deal I'm talking about. I'm just saying, you would be crazy not to have Jesus in your life. This should lead us to humility. Because who can be prideful after experiencing that reality? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. It's ridiculous. It's inconsistent. Let's go to the final part of our passage this morning. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place. This scripture is just fantastic. And gave him the name that's above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question for us this morning is simple. The question is not will we confess whether or not Jesus Christ is Lord, but when. Because we're all going to confess one day that Jesus Christ is Lord. The question is are we going to do it here or are we going to do it at another place? Because we didn't do it here, separated from God. We must confess Jesus, our salvation in him. We must confess to be friends of Jesus. We don't want, it, we want, we don't want to spend eternity separated from a loving God. And the problem is it goes back to our pride. And so understand, the pride is not only a problem in the church. We know that, right? I mean, Paul was writing to the church, but pride is a problem for everyone who ignores God. I, I, God hates pride. In, in James chapter 4, verse 6, and 1 Peter 5, 5, they both declare this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's say it together. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One more time with our, with our mouths open. God opposes the proud, <laughs> but gives grace to the humble. I'm going to keep using that joke, okay, I know, because I, I think it's funny. So, as we speak, God is doing two things always, opposing proud people and giving grace to humble people, always doing that. People who rise up in pride, he takes them down. People who humble themselves, he rises up. God actively opposes, fights against, declares war against, combats against proud people. That's just what God does. That's why our politicians, if they're full of pride, are going to have a difficult time leading. Sometimes it's not the policies that are the problem. It's the man. You can have a man that has the best policies in the world, but is full of pride. And it just ain't going to end well. We saw that in Brazil We've seen that and are seeing that in some perspectives in the states. That's just what happens when we're full of pride. So, some of us are fighting against God because we want to maintain this pride. And I'm just going to say this, you're not going to win. Fighting against God is futile. It's like, it's like my four-year-old daughter trying to beat me, and, uh, beat me up. It's just not going to happen. If I do like this little thing, I don't know how to say, but you know, this thing with her, who's going to win? I'm a 44-year-old uh, man, right? She's four years old. Now take that times a million, <laughs> and you have the example of God and us, right? Because it's not even really that great of an analogy. God, you can't fight against God. You can try, but it's foolish. It's foolish. It's foolish. God, fortunately, is very patient with us. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman, 
He doesn't always force himself on us, but you're not going to win if you fight with God. He opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. He opposes the person who's proud. He's, a, he, he's opposed to the person. He's opposed to the pastor that preaches out of pride. He's opposed to the person in the pews that thinks they know it all. He's opposed to the person who, who, who is constantly criticizing and not bringing anything helpful to the church because God values unity. He's opposed to the person who uses his leadership to manipulate. He's opposed to pride, but he's always on the side of those who are humble. He loves to bless. And here's, so here's the cool th- part. When you're humble, God loves to bless. He loves to even serve, to help. He loves to help those who walk in humility. And imagine what our churches would look like if we all walked in that kind of humility. And so I hope that this message this morning had helped you think through this question of whether or not you're struggling with pride and how God offers you an amazing solution in Jesus. And so it's not that only that I want you to live a life that's consistent with your faith, instead of a life that's inconsistent or ridiculous, it's that our families and our, and our churches and our lives will look radically different if we practice humility as a result of loving Jesus deeply. And as I've preached about before, you don't get humility by trying to be more humble. You get humility by finding Jesus. A forma que você vai ganhar humildade tem todo a ver com o que? Jesus. You only will gain humility if you have Jesus. You're not going to have humility trying to have humility on your own. Humility is something that is birthed from Jesus Christ. So, how do you kill pride? Jesus. How do you gain humility? Jesus. Who is the common ground here? Jesus, right? Don't try to do it on your own. In closing here, I have a few recommendations from a pastor named C.J. Mahaney, who wrote an excellent book on humility. These are some ways that you can clothe yourself in humility. Clothe yourself in humility. First, Mahaney wrote this. Have an honest assessment of yourself. Have an honest assessment of who you are. He says this. Follow the truth wherever it leads. If the truth leads to you were wrong, then admit you were wrong. If the truth leads to you should be fired, then you should be fired. If it leads to you need to apologize, then you need to apologize. Don't defend yourself. Don't always do what's in your best interest. Follow the truth to where it leads. He says that's an important point. Secondly, invite and pursue correction and counsel. And so we should be regularly telling someone in our lives, I'm blind to my own blindness. I need you to confront me. I need you to rebuke me sometimes. I need you to speak the truth to me. When I'm acting like a jerk, I need you to tell me. I need you to give me counsel because sometimes I don't know what to do. I need correction because sometimes I'm going to do the wrong thing. None of us should be at the place in our lives where we're above being corrected. Receive it. Don't fight. Don't argue. Don't blame others. Don't change the topic. If someone's giving you that correction, it's okay. Third, learn from everyone, including your enemies and your critics. Because oftentimes, your critics don't know how to say the right thing, but there's some truth in what they're telling you, right? There's some truth in the criticism. So the point is, is is, is getting that nugget of truth out there while ignoring all the bestia that's around that because they didn't know how to communicate it. Have the humility to overlook their pride because God may have something truthful in there for you. Fourth, Mahaney says, repent quickly and thoroughly. Repent quickly and thoroughly. Many problems that we have in the church environment happen because someone was unwilling to repent for something small early on. And it it became a bigger issue and a bigger issue and a bigger issue. And before you know it, you need to get the church leadership involved. And before you know it, there's church discipline. And before you know it, it just turns into this massive thing, all because at the very beginning, you were unwilling to say, I'm sorry, I sinned, I screwed up, I was wrong. Fifth, exalt the name of Jesus in everything that you do. And so, Mahaney says that the right answer to every question 
is what is going to make Jesus look great, because he is. And so sometimes, what does that look like in practice? Sometimes that means it's better to have a right relationship than to be right. Now, I'm not saying that we, we, we sacrifice, you know, biblical truths, but sometimes there are moments where you think you're so right that you're going to sacrifice your relationship for that, and sometimes you're not even right. Sometimes you think you're right, but you're not right. Or sometimes it's merely a question of someone has a different perspective. It's okay. But it's important for us to make Jesus look great. What makes Jesus look great? Pursuing unity. Not unity at all costs, but pursuing unity. So, do and say what exalts the name of Jesus, what's going to bring testimony to Jesus, and you're not going to regret it. There are many things in my ministry that I decided to go like this because I knew that if I focused on those things, I would bring a lot of stress to myself and my family. And I can't afford to do that. So we have to choose our battles. We have to choose our battles. We have to be wise. And I'm certain that you find yourselves in similar situations, right? And so... Exalt the name of Jesus in everything you do. What does the scripture say? We should do everything to the glory of God. Everything to the glory of God. Everything to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And so that's why I don't get, you know, I don't get hung up in all these little questions. Someone comes to me, well, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? You know, there's a lot of gray areas out there. And I'm not going to be like, well, no, yes, no, yes. Because what happens After you do that, then they think that you're the only authority and they don't begin to to learn how to think on their own, right? And as the famous Brazilian theologian Augustus Nicodemus says, right? So we should be, to, to believe is also to think. Thinking is not separated from our belief. So we need to become thinking people. And so part of us thinking means that in context where we're concerned about whether or not something is right, we should think about, is this going to bring glory to Jesus? And so therefore, in my view, in my view, questions about drinking, about dancing, about what you can watch in television, all those things, at the root, you should be asking yourself the question, can I do this for the glory of God? It's not like, well, secular music is wrong and Christian music is right, or uh, this kind of dance is okay and that kind of, I mean, you're going to have to resolve those things for yourself. You don't have to come to the pastor and say, well, Jay, I was just wondering, I did this move on the dance floor, was that okay? <laughs> I don't know, was it okay? What was in your mind? <laughs> well, I have woken up, pervert, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> no but, but it's like this, uh, come on. Use wisdom, use wisdom. If your father was an alcoholic, perhaps you shouldn't have alcohol in your house. Wisdom. Wisdom. Just use wisdom. Do what is going to glorify God in your situation. If you had an example of a family who occasionally opened a bottle of wine, and, that was, and you grew up, and your Christian family, fantastic family, and you decide to do that with your wife, use wisdom. That's okay. That's my reading. Now, you may have a different conviction. You may come to me after the service and say, Jay, Pastor Jay. Here's the point. Do everything to the glory of God. Think, meditate. Certainly, I'm here to answer questions, but your authority is Jesus at the end of the day. I'm just going to try my best to point you to him, right? He's a senior pastor of this church. I'm just kind of helping (laughs) at the end of the day, right? So, Do everything to the glory of God. And when you do everything to the glory of God, it's awesome. Because you start to walk in great humility. And you're known to be a person of humility. You're known to be a person who's consistent. You're known to be a person who doesn't have to explain everything that you're doing and give rationale for everything. Why? You don't have to second guess yourself. You don't have to second guess every decision that you make. You don't have to cover up after all the mistakes that you've, or or all these things that you think that you've done wrong. And always trying to fix this or, or Martin Lloyd-Jones once said this, the Christian man does not need to worry about the impression he makes all the time because when he's really walking with Christ, he's always giving the right impression. 
So we don't have to build up our reputation, our impression, about try to be perfect. We simply need to walk with Jesus, and we're going to make the right impression. And if, someone, if we give the wrong impression to someone, it's not our problem, because we're walking with Jesus. We're walking in humility. So, my prayer is that as a church, we grow in humility because we love Jesus more than loving what we want. Jesus gave himself up for us. The least we can do is to follow him, giving him our lives and saying, Jesus, do what you want with my life. And so, the mantra is be like Jesus, kill your pride, pursue humility. And I can guarantee the more you fall in love with Jesus, the more those two things are going to happen and the testimony of this church is going to be incredible to the community around us. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that all of us face, including myself as the pastor of this church, of walking in humility, of killing pride, of embracing humility, and of challenging those areas in our lives where we've walked in pride. Father, would you help us to be like Jesus? Would you help us to have the same mindset? Would you help us to consider others before ourselves? Father, this is not some kind of like deal where, where, where we say we don't care about ourselves and we want the worst for us. We actually know that this is going to be better for us in the long run, Father. We know that this is going to produce more fruit. We know that this is going to make us a better person. So help prosper us, Lord, by pursuing you. And this prospering may mean that we, we bear the fruits of the Spirit. It may mean that we see more people come to know you. It may mean that our, our lives grow greatly as a result in you. And so, Father, this morning... Help us to be like-minded. Help us to see you as the example who humbled yourself, who became obedient to death on the cross, and who was resurrected for our sake. For those of us who don't know you this morning, Father, we pray that you would reveal yourselves to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship this morning.